So let's go ahead and define what the genesis is going to be for our blockchain and, and build a little package that will allow us to read that off of, you know, re read that information most likely off of disk. That's usually where it's stored. Um, and so we have the origins or the beginning of the state of the blockchain. All right, so here's our blockchain one video repo. And if I go into foundation, you see that there's nothing there. The, the code that we have here, just as a reminder, is the initial web service code that, come, that came out of um, the ultimate service class. So I took the ultimate service class, all of that web stuff, and we start that as a foundation so we're not spending time um, building that. If you want to understand that code, go, go definitely watch the ultimate service class. Now, if I go to the original project, we're going to see a, I'm going to call it a blockchain layer. What I tried to do here is create all the different packages that we're going to need to build in order to have this really nice reference implementation of a blockchain. And you can see that there's Genesis under there. That's where we're starting right now. So I'm going to add our blockchain layer here, blockchain layer. There it is. And then I'm going to add the Genesis layer. Sometimes I, I misspell, I forget that extra E. And then like all packages with a purpose, it's going to have a file named after the package, genesis.go. And I'm going to come in here and scroll to the top and I want to make sure I get the comments in there to keep everybody nice and happy with my Go doc. Okay, so this package Genesis, its job is to help us manage the Genesis information, really not manage it in terms of mutating, but really to read it, which means that we need some Genesis information. Now, at least when it comes to Ethereum, the Genesis information is stored as a JSON document and then kind of read in if you were to start that node. So let's go over to that Z block folder. And you can see here, I've got some private keys already. We're going to get to that in the next section. But if I go back over to the original project here, you see a genesis.json file right there under zblock. I use the zblock to hold all of the actual data, databases, things like that that we're, we're managing. So I'm going to add a new file called genesis.json. We're going to use JSON2 as the storage um, protocol for our, our genesis information. So if I open this up, I'm going to bring this in here. We're going to study it. Now, the Genesis um, file for, say, Ethereum is different than mine, right? I mean, that's a more production-oriented, ready to go. There's a lot more sort of global settings and different ones. I'm not trying to rewrite Ethereum or Bitcoin. I'm trying to build a reference implementation. So the semantics and the behavior are the same without a lot of the extra complexity um, that we don't need to learn this. So these are the global settings and accounts that we're starting with for the Arden blockchain. You can see a date. You can see here um, when I started this project, literally December 17th, 2021. That is really the origin when I started learning blockchain. And then we've got this idea of a chain ID. Every blockchain has a chain ID and every blockchain wants, needs to have a unique chain ID. The chain ID is built all the way back into really the transaction system, as you're going to see. We want this because what you don't want is your wallet or you performing some sort of transaction against the blockchain and it being the wrong blockchain. <laughs> that would be bad. And you don't think that will happen? It happens all the time because you might have in your wallet a bunch of different accounts for different blockchains that you're talking to. And it could even be from a developer standpoint, your dev local, your, your test net, your main net, this net, that net. And it's quite easy at times to forget to switch over to that other net and perform an operation. And so this chain ID is a way to protect us as well from, oh, you know, the blockchain can say, hey, 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 no, you sent this transaction for chain ID 25, and I'm two, so I'm going to reject it. So the chain ID is really important, and it's really important in a, in a public ecosystem that, that um, every sort of blockchain instance that's running there has its own chain ID. So since this is the Arden blockchain, and this is, this is our own sort of universe here, I'm using chain ID 1. 
Uh, but you could see like when we when we do dev on Ethereum, I think the blockchain ID that we use is like 1337, right? 1337. Um, and again, that will change depending on what you're talking to. Okay, transactions per block. We're gonna have to talk about this later as well. How do you decide um, how many transactions are allowed to be in a block at any given time. These are big conversations we have to have. Even Ethereum over the years has changed these sorts of rules and went from fixed blocks to, to um, blocks that weren't fixed in size, blocks that are based on the amount of gas, blocks that are, like, there's a lot of science um, that has to go into this. We're gonna keep it simple. What we're gonna say is we're gonna have fixed size blocks where um, no more than 10 transactions will be in any block. We're gonna just keep it simple. Ethereum uh, does this in a much more complicated way, and they have to, right? I, and there's this balance also between um, the size of the block and network bandwidth and the size of the block and how long it might take to process that block. And there's, we're gonna talk about all this stuff, I promise you. Um, but for the ARM blockchain, we're gonna keep it simple, and we're gonna use this setting to di dictate that we'll never have more than 10 transactions. You could have less, could have less, but we, we will never have more. Difficulty level. Now, at some point, we're going to get into this idea of a consensus algorithm. And when we start talking about proof of work consensus, what that means is that we're going to have an algorithm that has to perform a, a, a large number of iterations over the data that we're, we want to seal into the blockchain. And the idea is that we're looking for something. And, and there's no sort of function, right, polynomial function to find it. You, it's literally brute force when we talk about proof of work. So the difficulty level is going to be related to the difficulty it will be to solve that proof of work puzzle later on when we, when we get to that. Now, on a system like Ethereum, um, when they were running on proof of work, they're now running on proof of stake. And I, we also have an implementation of, I'm going to call it proof of authority, though proof of authority and stake semantically are very similar. The only difference is going to be what's at stake, like what do you lose? Um, and we're going to talk about these things, I promise you. I don't want to put the cart too far ahead of the horse here. But um, when Ethereum was running on a proof of work algorithm, that difficulty level would adjust all the time to make sure that the cadence of transactions being mined was anywhere between 12 to 14 seconds. So if things were taking longer, they could reduce the difficulty level. If it was taking, uh, it was too short, they could increase the difficulty level. A lot of complexity in that, right? And then over time, you have to know what that uh, difficulty level was. So. Whew, we ain't gonna get into any of that here with the R and blockchain. We don't need to, right? This is a reference implementation. I'm gonna keep telling you that. So our difficulty level is gonna be fairly static, which means that when we run proof of work here on the R and blockchain, there is no consistent cadence when doing um, proof of work and mining. You'll see that too when we get to it. Again, it doesn't need, we don't need that right now in our reference implementation. So the difficulty is gonna be tied to our proof of work consensus algorithm, and we'll see that. Now, mining reward. At some point, I told you that we're gonna have this, this genesis. It's gonna say how much money is in the system, how much gold um, is currently backing the system. We can think about it that way. So let's just imagine that we, that we have a pot of gold behind us, or we've decided to take cash, and we've decided to escrow that cash, and we're gonna say, okay, the blockchain is being backed by that pot of gold or this cash that's in escrow that nobody's allowed to talk, right? So we're gonna feed the blockchain some amount of money, and we're gonna put that in reserve, right? And, and then the origin accounts will have, uh, will represent that. So actually, if you go look on line eight here, you see here that I've got two accounts in the origin. Okay, this account, for the Arden blockchain is gonna be mine, and this one's gonna be another developer on the project named Pavel. And let's imagine what, what Pavel and I have done is we've, we've taken a million dollars out of our bank accounts and we've put them in escrow. So there it is, we've got a million dollars in escrow, there's two million dollars there, and that's what's seeding the money supply um, for our blockchain. That's the way I'm gonna think about this here, okay? And so that means that 
one unit maybe of ARD, maybe we have a currency here called ARD, A-R-D, one, one unit of ARD maybe starts out being worth one, say, fiat USD dollar or something, right? Like we, I, I'm not gonna get into the economics, but if we, just to keep our heads going here, let's just imagine that one ARD, at least right now, is worth one US dollar, and we've got two million dollars in escrow backing that up. So I've got a million, Pavel's got a million, we've escrowed it, we're ready to go. So that's fine, right? But then if this is the only way to bring new money in the system, um, that's gonna be a problem. So we're gonna need other ways of bringing in sort of new money. Now one way will be to allow people to take money from the outside and, and, and bring it in, right? We're gonna have to look at how that happens, but also the idea is that it's going to cost money to run the system. Uh, and we're going to get into this when we get back into the consensus protocols. I'm, I'm kind of giving you the, like, like what's coming here, right? Like what's coming. So, so what's going to have to happen here is that um, we want to give an incentive for people to stand up their own nodes to keep the system up and running. So I want you to think of these two settings, the mining reward and the gas price, as the incentive for you out there to run your own Arden node. So anytime that you get to write the next block of data to the blockchain, as part of the consensus algorithm we'll talk about, the system is gonna give you magically $700, 700 Ard of money. And then anybody who wants to transact on the blockchain, well, it's gonna cost them 15 units if we just think in terms of dollars right now, it's going to cost them 15 bucks. That's really expensive, right? But 15 units of, of currency to um, transact. And this is simple. I mean, Ethereum's a lot more complicated here, right? The, 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 the gas price on something like Ethereum changes all the time depending on demand. So it's constantly being calculated. And people can can choose what they want to pay and not pay, and then nodes can choose whether do they want to accept your transactions or not. Like we're not doing, we're not going to do any of that. That's super complicated stuff. You would need that in a in a real live system. What we're going to do is just keep it simple, right? You want to perform a transaction to cost you 15 units. Um, if you are the next one to write to the blockchain, we're going to give you 700 units of currency as a reward, as an incentive to spend that time and money and energy running a node. That's what it's all about there, in the incentive. So these are gonna be our, um, our settings right now, okay? Our chain ID, our transactions per block, our difficulty, the mining reward when we get to mining, so give the incentive for people to, to run a node, the fee that we're gonna have to pay every time we wanna execute a transaction on the system, and then, again, the origin balances um, for these two accounts, they start with money in the system, and then as new accounts come in, either I can give them some of that money, or they become miners and they create their own money, or at some point we find a way to um, on-ramp new new money, right? Or where I can somebody can say, "Hey, I got a hundred USD. I'd like to bring that into the system." So we've got all these other ways of bringing money in. So this is our Genesis file right here. These are the settings that we're gonna use for our reference implementation. And now that we've got this on, on a, in a JSON file on disk, we're gonna to have to now be able to read that off of disk when the node starts.